regular, regular basis. Um, by the way, last week after we made the uh, father's car wash announcement, uh, I had one of the dads in the church ask me, uh, am I limited to the number of cars that I can bring? And I just told him, I said, after a certain point of time, we're going to check titles and licenses just to make sure they actually are yours. But no, no limit to the cars you can bring. We just want to be an outreach. We want to serve the dads of our church. We want to serve the dads uh, in our community. I'm so thankful for the chance to get to share with you uh, the love and peace of Christ today. Uh, before we do that, I want us to pray together again. I think God's already doing some things in this room, and I think he's uh, going to continue to do some things in the room. But uh, as we pray, I specifically want to ask you to pray with me. Uh, tomorrow, uh, we do this every year, but tomorrow we send 20 uh, children and adults to children's camp. Uh, they'll be leaving here about 1230. And so we are excited to send them and for the experience they're going to get to have as they get to to meet Jesus and, and, and come to know Jesus even better. So uh, we want to pray for them right now. So let's just pray together. Father, thanks so much for uh, the things you're at work doing in our lives. Thank you so much uh, for the things that uh, we get to watch. Father, I know you're already moving in this place, that your spirit's already touching hearts. And God, I pray that uh, the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart would be pleasing in your sight, God, that nothing I say would be distracting, but that today Jesus would be lifted up and that People will be drawn to his power and his ability to do for them whatever they need today. Father, thank you um, for this opportunity to share and show the love of Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. Hey, one other thing I forgot uh, to announce. Uh, Pastor Jed Woolridge and Bailey celebrate their seventh anniversary today. And so we're, we're excited for that. And so we just are thankful for their ministry among us and their service. And just congratulations on that, um, I may pay for that later. So we'll, um, if I don't show up next week, somebody come looking, all right? All right. Hey, starting a, a summer series. We, we do this every year. We call it summer school. As we jump into a, a section of the scripture that we just want to dig into, we've gone through the book of Proverbs. Uh, one summer we just did a Psalm 119, a Psalm, the longest chapter in the Bible about the word of God. And today, because we're in the, in the Jesus material, we're jumping in uh, to the Gospel of Mark. If you're just becoming familiar uh, with this book that we call the Bible, it's divided into two sections, 39 books uh, are in what we call the Older Testament, and they take place from about the beginning of time until 400 years before Jesus. And then there's a 400 year period of silence. It's called the intertestamental period between the testaments. And then the, the New Testament opens up 27 books that talk about uh, from when Jesus appeared onto the scene till he ascended into heaven and the movement of the church across the ancient world. And, and, and then the New Testament starts with, with four books books, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, uh, that are called the Gospels. We'll, we'll see where that comes from a little bit later today. And, and we want to spend the entire summer, Pastor Wolders and I want to spend the entire summer with you uh, digging through the, through the Gospel of Mark. So if you brought a Bible, and I hope you bring one with you, uh, find the Gospel of Mark in your Bible. Uh, while you're doing that, what you might not know is that whenever I put a teaching series together, I don't advertise this, but every teaching series comes with a soundtrack. Uh, just music that I listen to as I'm preparing, as I'm putting it together, just, just stays fresh in my mind. And, and this series is no different. And so uh, I, I was thinking about the Gospel of Mark. How do I communicate what the Gospel of Mark's about? How do I communicate what the Gospel of Mark's about? And this song came into my head. Now, now if you've been around here long enough, you know that I have this unusual, weird ability to remember lyrics uh, to songs, especially like jingles, uh, theme songs. And so I'm thinking about the Gospel of Mark, thinking about the Gospel of Mark, and the NBA, the National Basketball Association, pops into my mind. I'm like, okay, that's weird. Not the National Basketball Association of today, but the NBA when I started watching it back when I was a kid. And back when I was a kid, uh, early 70s, mid 70s, uh, believe this or not, uh, not all NBA games were shown live. <laughs> you couldn't watch every game. Some of the games, even the final games, sometimes were even on delay. But when they showed up on TV, it was a big deal. And there was a theme song to the NBA from 1973 to 1976 that is stuck in my head. And I want to throw back, and I want you to enjoy this. I'm not going to play the whole thing, but there's one line from this theme song that you're going to hear every week when we get together to go through the Gospel of Mark. And so enjoy the graphics from the 1970s and the lyrics to the NBA theme song from 1973 to 1976. Watch this with me. All you got, take your very best shot, and may the best team win. The time is now, the name 
There you go. The time is now, the name of the game is action. It looked really active, didn't it, with that, those great graphics from 1973? Uh, uh, say it with me, the time is now, the name of the game is action. The time is now, the name of the game is action. One more time, the time is now, the name of the game is action. If ever, if ever anybody asks you, what is the gospel of Mark about? That's the sentence. The time is now, the name of the game is action. The time is now, the name of the game is action. And so we begin to dig into this gospel and we're going to see why that is. Before we get to the chapter one, we're gonna go through all the way through chapter one today, uh, but before we get to that, we just need to talk about some, some introductory matters. Some introductory matters. Uh, who's the human author? Uh, we believe the human author is a young man named John Mark. Uh, bears his name Mark, but other places in the scripture he's called John Mark. And from the scriptures, there are some certain things that we know about him. One of the things we know about him is his mother's name is Mary. She's very prominent in the church after Jesus uh, ascends into heaven and the church is meeting in Jerusalem. Uh, the church meets in her home. In fact, if you want to read through the book of Acts and you want to get to like chapter 12-ish, something like that. Uh, some of the apostles are thrown into prison and they're praying for them to get out. This all night long prayer meeting takes place in Mary's house, the house of John Mark's mother. She's prominent. She's, she's by this we, we, we infer that she's rich, that he comes from a family of wealth, that he has a house big enough that people can come and gather in to pray. And so you remember in the book of Acts, it said people they met uh, daily in the temple courts and from house to house. This is one of the houses where the early church started. Uh, this is John Mark's heritage. Uh, one of the other things we know about John Mark is that uh, he had a passion for spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ. As, as Paul and Barnabas begin to take the gospel on missionary journeys across the ancient world, uh, on a missionary journey, uh, John Mark's invited to go with them and they, they leave uh, the area of Jerusalem. They sail to what is... Uh, modern day Cyprus, they travel all across Cyprus and they head north, they go north across the Mediterranean Sea to this city called Perga. And when they get to Perga, something happens. The scripture doesn't tell us what happens. But there's some conflict between the three missionaries who've gone on this journey. And, and, and Paul especially gets into some kind of disagreement, very unsatisfied with John Mark's service, and John Mark just leaves. He goes back to Jerusalem, he doesn't finish the missionary journey, and, and he departs. And so there's conflict among God's people trying to spread uh, the word of God, and, and John, we don't know why. Later on, that, that relationship's going to be healed up, and it's going to be uh, restored, which is what ought to happen in Christian relationships, right? But uh, there's this disagreement, and there's this separation, and John Mark leaves. As, as it describes John Mark's role, Acts chapter 13 uses a very interesting word to describe John Mark. It says, they had John Mark as their helper. Some of the translations you're reading from, oh, by the way, let me hit pause. Through this teaching series, I'm gonna be preaching and using scripture references from the Christian Standard Bible translation. It's the Bible that I'm currently reading through this year um, uh, as my own, my own personal study. So that's the translation I'm gonna be reading from. That's what you're gonna see. Uh, Pastor Rulers may choose others and that's fine, but just so you know. Um, but, but it says it had them as their helper. It's the word servant. Some of your translations say servant. And there are like five different Greek words for servant. Uh, this word is literally uh, huperertes. It, it literally means under rower. Think about the boats that travel across the Mediterranean Sea, not driven by steam, not driven by engines, driven by human people paddling oars out the side of the boats. They're underneath the deck. They, they don't see outside. They just give command, get here command. Uh, this is menial labor. This is, this is subservient service. This is, this is not in the spotlight. This is not any of those kind of things. This is what it means to be a servant, to just be told what to do and to do it faithfully. Uh, executing official orders, operating under direct orders. This was John Mark. He just did what he was told to do and somehow, some way there's this discrepancy. We also find out about John Mark that he's very close to the apostle Peter. Peter in one of his letters says about John Mark, he's my son, not literally my physical flesh and blood, but he's like my son in the ministry. I have this close connection. He's very closely connected uh, to John Mark. Those are the things we know about him for sure. But there are a couple other things I think that maybe are true about John Mark. I can't prove this to you from the scriptures, but one of the things I'd encourage you to do this summer is, is sit down and, and read the Gospel of Mark from chapter one all the way through chapter 16 in one setting. It'll take you about 30 minutes. 
It's going to read quickly. You're going to move fast through it. But as you read the gospel from beginning to end, which, by the way, is the way we ought to at some point read every one of the 66 books from beginning to end, because that's how they came to us in that unit, not with chapter divisions, not with verse divisions. That's another sermon for another time. But as you read the gospel of Mark, a couple of things stand out that are, that are different about his gospel than others. One of them is, is that he tells the story of Jesus' crucifixion, which, by the way, spends about 40% of his gospel in the last week of Jesus' life. As he tells the story of Jesus getting arrested and taken to the cross, it says that all of the disciples fled, but he gives us something that none of the other gospel writers give us. He gives us an insight about about one person that was there who was following close to Jesus, and and the the Roman guards and the authorities came after him, and and they found him, and they they reached for him, and they grabbed his clothing. It was basically just like a sheet, and they, they ripped it off of him, and he ran away naked. Nobody else tells us that. It's the only gospel account that gives us that. What it indicates to us is that this person who only has enough to basically wear a sheet on their body and nothing else is incredibly poor, but they're following Jesus with all their heart all the way to the cross. And I, and I wonder, could, could it be that Mark gives us that? Could, could that be Mark? You say, well, I thought you said he came from a wealthy family. He did. The other gospels, along with Mark, give us another story. We call it the story of the rich young ruler. The story of the young man that approaches Jesus and says, what do I have to do to have eternal life? And Jesus says, keep all the commands. And this young man says, I've done that since I was young. And Jesus looks at him and says, okay then, go sell everything you possess, give it to the poor, and then come follow me. And what the scriptures tell us in Mark chapter 10 and the other gospels is that that young man walked away sad. And we don't hear anything else about him. But Mark gives us an interesting insight that none of the other gospel writers give us in that encounter of the rich young man with Jesus. Mark's gospel says this. Mark's gospel says this, that Jesus looked at him and loved him. Who would know that except the one that Jesus looked into his eyes and loved? I wonder, could it be that the rich young ruler was Mark, where we're not ever told. Uh, Could it be that somewhere this rich young ruler then does exactly what Jesus said to do, goes and sells everything that he possesses and only has the clothes on his back and follows Jesus to the cross when stuff is ripped off him? Could could it be? I, I just wonder. I don't know about you, but when I read the scriptures, especially when I read them beginning to end, all kinds of questions raised, and that's one of the questions in my mind as I read through the gospel. Could could this be him? But regardless, you you, you see it on the screen. The point is this, isn't it just like God to use a once unfaithful servant to tell the story of the ever faithful servant Jesus? Maybe that's encouraging for you today. Maybe you've blown it. Maybe you've been unfaithful. Maybe Jesus had said something to you and confronted you with the truth and you've walked away from that sad because you just didn't want to live your life that way. Isn't it just like God to use the once unfaithful servant to tell the story of the ever faithful servant, Jesus Christ? That's the human author. Well, well, who's the audience? Here's what you need to know about the audience of Mark. The audience is Gentiles in general, Romans in specific. Mark is not writing to a Jewish audience. We, We know this as we look. Mark quotes less from the Old Testament than any of the other gospels. Mark only gives you about 60 Old Testament quotes Some of the Gospels give you almost twice as that many. Not that he doesn't quote the Old Testament, but it's just not important to his hearers. Um, He he interprets, Mark interprets uh, the Aramaic words, and the other Gospel writers don't. For example, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which translated means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Mark gives you that, because his hearers, his readers are Roman. Uh, They don't understand the Aramaic language. They need it to be interpreted for them. Uh, Mark also uses some Latin words that none of the other gospel writers use. When he starts talking about the Roman legions and the people that, that, that killed Jesus, he uses Latin phrases like executioners. And none of the other gospel writers give us that. Mark's writing very specifically to a Gentile audience. He does not give us the nativity. He does not give us the genealogy. He jumps in and he gets going because he's got an audience in mind. That's the human audience. But did you know 
this, you're also part of the audience. Next verse, I think, that's going to be on the, on the screen, I think. Says God, yeah, there it is. Uh, There's nothing like the written word of God for showing you the way to salvation through faith in Christ and Jesus. Every part of scripture is God breathed. By the way, the human author is John Mark. The spiritual author is God himself. God himself has breathed. There, there's debate about which of the gospel was written first, when were they written, uh, and you can find that study uh, fascinating, and, and hopefully I'll, we'll be talking about some of that over the course of the series, but, but, but you just need to know that this didn't come from men who devised up a story on their own, that God breathed it. But this is every part of the scriptures God breathed in youthful one way or another, showing us truth exposing our rebellion, correcting our mistakes, training us to live God's way. Through the word, we are put together again, shaped up to do the good work God has for us. You are part of the audience that God had in mind when this book was God-breathed. He wants your attention, and he wants it to change the way you live. He wants it to get you to the point where you understand the time is now, the name of the game is action, and your response is, I will. I will. I will. It's the human. Uh, the, the main theme is service. Uh, I'll put it this way. The main theme is the active love of God serving and giving through Jesus Christ. The, the active love of God. This is a book of action. We see God in action. We see Jesus moving. He's on the move. He's going from here. He's going to there. In, in fact, uh, the key verse of the gospel of Mark is Mark chapter 10, verse 45 that says this, for the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. In fact, did you know that you can outline the book of Mark this way? Jesus serving, chapters 1 through 9. Jesus giving his life, chapters 10 through 16. The Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. It's the active love of God seen in Jesus serving and giving. And it's, an, it's a gospel of action. Mark has a favorite word. He uses it over 40 times in his gospel. And the word is translated, in most English translations, immediately. Some of your translations translate it straightway. Immediately this happens. Immediately Jesus goes from one thing to another. Immediately, 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 immediately. Over 40 times. Mark is a man in a hurry to tell this story. And he wants you to know that things move rapidly, that Jesus is on the move, that you and I need to be on the move to share the gospel, to show the love of Christ. It's on the move immediately, immediately, immediately. And we're going to see that as we dig through chapter 1 today. Immediately, immediately, immediately. And so I want you, if you have your Bible, uh, to open it. And I want you to see John chapter 1, uh, Mark, I'm sorry, Mark chapter 1, verse 1. If I ever say another gospel, I'm really, he means Mark, just so you know. See, Andy, I forget what I'm supposed to say too. And so uh, Mark chapter 1, verse 1, it says, uh, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, Son of God. The beginning of the gospel. Mark is the biblical writer of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John that gives us the word gospel. The other writers don't give us this word. Mark gives us this word. This is the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's the euangelion. It's the the good news of God as expressed in Jesus Christ. It's good news. Can you believe that there was a world that lived in turmoil? There was a world that lived with a crisis of illegal, illegal immigrants, people that didn't belong in the country, flooding into the country. Can you believe there was a society that lived with political division, filled with all kinds of bad news, filled with all kinds of hatred, filled with all kinds of of, of anxiousness against people that aren't on my side of the issue, filled with all kinds of bad news. Into that, Mark says, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, this is the beginning of the good news of God as discovered in Jesus Christ. It's the beginning of the good news. It's the place to begin is with the good news. And we live in a world that's divided. We live in a world that's filled with hatred. We live in a world where everybody has an opinion. And if you're not on my side, that means I must hate you. I love what Angie said, that, that when we love our neighbor, you see, you see, the scripture only tells us there are two kinds of people in our lives, neighbors and enemies. And the gospel says love them both. Jesus says love them both. Neighbors and enemies, love them both. That's the gospel seen in action, the call on our lives. So chapter one, verse one, is the beginning of the gospel. Now those of us that are familiar with the scriptures, the beginning of the gospel, great, here comes the wonderful, warm, fuzzy, little baby Jesus story. Born of a virgin, angels shouting from heaven, cows, sheep, goats, whatever, wise men. No, none of that. 
Mark doesn't give that to you. He says the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and he jumps in verses two through eight right into the story of a guy named John the Baptizer. He, he introduces it with a prophecy. Remember I told you that he uses some Old Testament. He quotes from the book of Malachi. He quotes from the book of Isaiah. And he says, hey, God made a promise. Remember his hearers. We weren't gonna be concerned with any of those other details. I just, I just want you to know. He says, hey, uh, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, God made a promise. And his promise was to send a rescuer and a redeemer to mankind. He promised to bring good news into a world filled with bad news. And before he was going to show up, he promised that he'd send a messenger. Somebody was going to come before him, and that happened. And there was this guy named John the Baptizer who showed up. He appeared, it says, in the wilderness, by the, in the Judean wilderness, and he's preaching the baptism uh, of for, or he's preaching preaching repentance, baptism for the forgiveness of sins, and he wears weird clothes and he eats weird stuff. But people are flooding to him. And he's baptizing people in the Jordan River, in the river of death, and they're coming up, and they have a new kind of life. What he wants you to know is he tells the story of John the baptizer is very simply this. God calls people to prepare the way. John the baptizer came to prepare the way of Jesus' first coming. You and I are on planet Earth to prepare the way for his second coming. What's happening in the Judean wilderness is a spiritual revival that's sweeping across the land, a place where nobody expected for it to break out. But when God's people share and show the love of Jesus in powerful ways, people are attracted to it, and spiritual awakening sweeps a country. And John is in a place that's unlikely. This is a wake-up call. John the baptizer is out there, and he's just telling about Jesus, sharing and showing. But here's, here's the deal. John the baptizer is very, very specific. He says, hey, I want you to know, this is not about me. There's one who's coming after me. And he says, I'm I'm not even worthy to untie his sandals. Every first year Greek student who studies New Testament Greek uh, struggles with that phrase because it's a very interesting word that, that Mark uses. It's not, we, we translate the best we can sandals, but literally it's bind underlings. And it's a Greek word that's put together, so you have to learn how the words are put together. But it's just this thing, and basically the point is we can get caught up in the details, but, but forgive the crudeness of the language, please, but since we started with a sports NBA illustration, I, I think it's important. We, we wouldn't say it this way. We wouldn't say I'm not worthy uh, to untie a sandal. Uh, in today's culture, you know what we say? I'm not worthy to carry his jock strap. He's so much more than I am. and it's all about him and it's not about me. Don't don't look at me and think there's anything great about me. I'm not worthy. He's pointing people consistently to Jesus. Verses eight through 13, it's a wake-up call that God's about ready to do something new. Get ready, get prepared, and it's all about him. You think this is something, just wait for what God's about ready to do. Then in verses nine through 14, all of a sudden Jesus appears. Chapter uh, Chapter one, verse nine says this, that Jesus came Notice, if you would please, if you have your Bible, it also says that in verse 14, that Jesus came. And on our English, it reads exactly the same, but it's not the same. I need you to see this. It's not the same. In verses 9 through 13, Jesus came. Sorry for the grammar lesson. It's in, passive, in the passive voice. It means that Jesus came and something was done to him. Verse 14, Jesus came preaching. That's Jesus in the active voice. Jesus is doing something. And so in the passive voice in chapter 1, verses 9 through 13, it's talking about two things that came that that happened to Jesus. The first one was that he was baptized, and the second was that he was tempted. These things happened to him, that Jesus came and he was baptized. And what we begin to see in his baptism very simply is this. he, he, He comes And we know from the other Gospels that he and John get into a little bit of a discussion that John doesn't want to baptize him, but Jesus is baptized. And as Jesus is baptized, three things happen. Identification, empowerment, and assurance. Identification, empowerment, and assurance. Baptism for us. By the way, we're having baptism services July the 14th. I know there are some of you that have been waiting to be baptized, others of you that have not taken the step of obedience and you need to be baptized. Baptism for human beings is is a step of identification that we identify uh, with God. Uh, 500 years before Jesus, so often we attach to baptism the concept of water. But 500 years before baptism of Jesus, 
The word baptized didn't have anything to do with water. If you wanted to take a piece of blue cloth and make it yellow, you took it to the baptizer. You took it to the one who would tie-dye your cloth, the dyer. If you wanted to take a piece of red cloth and make it green, you would take it to the dyer. It's to, it's to identify, it's to, it's to change the essence, it's to, it's to mark the color that you now wear. I, you probably wonder, and my wife is out of town, so that says a lot about why I'm wearing what I'm wearing today, but um, you probably, I strategically uh, chose this shirt. You can't see all of it, but you see the color and you see the logo. It represents, go ahead, the Dayton Flyers. How did you know that? You knew that because of the color. You knew that because of the color. I have to ask what shirt I was wearing. I don't have to open my shirt and see to hear that it says Dayton. You, you knew already. Baptism identifies you. Baptism is saying, I put on the colors of Jesus. I choose Jesus. I've been changed from the inside out, and the only thing people should see, and the only thing people should be able to identify in me is Jesus. Nobody should have to ask. It's a picture of identification at a baptism. Jesus didn't need to uh, uh, identify with God because he was God. Jesus came and was baptized to identify with us, to show us that he was fully God and fully human. The second thing that happens at his baptism is, is that uh, there's this empowerment. Look, it says um, um, that Jesus uh, from now that came baptized in the Jordan River as soon as he came up out of the water, He saw the heavens being opened and the spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, you are my beloved son. With you I am well pleased. Uh, A a, a dove, the the heavens open up and and a dove descends. The Holy Spirit, we know from the scriptures that the Holy Spirit is power. Jesus is gonna say to his followers after he rises from the dead and before he ascends into into heaven, go back to Jerusalem and wait and when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you will receive power. The Holy Spirit is a picture of empowerment that comes upon God, but, it, but it's weird. Our, our, our athletic teams, uh, we use birds as athletic symbols, right? Eagles and hawks. Nobody would be afraid of the doves if you played the doves, right? It, it's, a, it, it's, it, it's a weird symbol. It's a symbol of love and peace. Jesus' power is an upside-down kind of power. The power that God uses to unfill us is a power to love our neighbor, to love our enemy, to walk as much as it depends on us in peace with everyone. That's the kind of power that happens that ought to be represented at baptism. It's a picture of empowerment, but it's also a picture, it's also a picture of assurance and a voice immediately came up out of heaven as Jesus rose out of the water and said, you are my beloved son, with you I am well pleased. You're my child, my dear, dear child, and you bring me joy. And at your baptism, not only is it identifying with Christ, but you ought to rise up. The scriptures say buried with Christ in baptism, raised to walk in the newness of life. And the newness of life is symbolized by power and assurance. We kind of take that out of our baptism experience. It becomes ritual and it just becomes routine. But it's a picture of power and assurance and identification. And Jesus, my friend, here, here's the point of this. You and I, as followers of Jesus, need a moment where we see the heavenly vision and we hear the heavenly voice. And we never forget it. Where the heavens opened up. The Spirit of God descends on you and fills you with power when you ask Jesus to be your Savior. It never goes away. We need to keep on being filled with the Spirit. We can talk about that later. But you also need to hear the voice that never goes away. Some of you are so hard of hearing that voice. Don't think God would ever speak to you. He loves you. This has been true in my relationship with my daughters, but even more true as they're now out of the house. There are moments when I'm thinking about them, like I know what's going on in their day and I don't want to interrupt, but there are just moments when as their dad, I just want to call them and say, hey, I just want to tell you I love you. I'm proud of you. I'm cheering you on today. Because sometimes a father just needs to say it, whether our ears are ready to hear it or not. And today, I pray that you'll see the heavenly vision of the power of peace that's yours. You'll hear the heavenly voice that says, you are my child. I love you. I take joy in you. I delight in you. I pray you'll hear that as the picture So Jesus came and he was baptized. Then look at verse 13. 
verse 12 and 13, it says, immediately the spirit drove him into the wilderness. We know about the temptations of Jesus, but, but most of us, when we talk about this, we talk about what the other gospel writers give us, that Jesus was led by the spirit into the wilderness. It's not the word Mark uses. Mark doesn't use the word led. Mark uses the word drove. Probably doesn't need much explanation. There's a difference in being led and being driven. God was not going to give Jesus a choice. After his baptism, after he had spoken uh, his words of assurance, after he had identified and given him all the power that he needed, God drove him face to face with evil. For 40 days, he confronted evil head on. And he would spend the rest of his ministry confronting evil head on. And in those moments, he had to be assured and he had to walk with power. And the Spirit of God drove him to the wilderness. We don't like to hear that. We don't like to think that God would drive us into confrontation with evil. God would drive us into situations that are going to stretch our faith, that are going to depend and demand our reliance on his Holy Spirit. We've been talking about the last five weeks that whenever Jesus talked about the future, he talked about the future so that we would live differently in the present. To live in present, and the present is to live in power and to live with the assurance that whatever I confront, God is in control. He drove him into a fierce spiritual battle. And all we see, Mark doesn't give us the three temptations. All Mark gives us is he drove him into this wilderness where he was tempted. The wild animals were with him. There's physical danger. It's a battle against Satan. There's spiritual danger. And the angels were ministering to him. My friend, here's the point I want you to take away, and I think Mark doesn't want you to get into all the details of the different temptations. Mark is trying to tell you a story, and I think what Mark's trying to tell you is this, that when God forces the issue with you, the spiritual forces needed for victory are already with you. And some of you right now are in a spiritual battle like you've never had before, and God seems to be forcing the issue, and he's not, being, he, he's not letting up, and he's just driving you, driving you, driving you to the place of trust. And I just want you to know there's, there's physical opposition and there's spiritual opposition, but when God forces the issue, the spiritual forces for your victory are already around you, ministering to you. You have the assurance and you have the power to do whatever it is God wants you to do. Don't miss that. Between verses 13 and 14 in Mark's gospel, Mark skips an entire year of Jesus' public ministry because he's a man in a hurry. And the next thing we see in verse 14 is that Jesus came preaching. And we don't get the Sermon on the Mount. We don't get the long sermons. What Mark gives us is 17 words. My paraphrase of the 17 words is this. The time is now. The name of the game is action. Jesus came preaching a 17-word sermon. The time has come. The kingdom of God has drawn near. Repent and believe the good news. The time is now. The name of the game is action. And the action that's demanded on you and I is repentance and belief. Repentance. It's a change of mind. It's a change of direction. You're headed the wrong way down a one-way street, and if you don't turn around and go the other way, you're in danger. Can can I just say to you, and this is going to hit some of you the wrong way, One of the things these people had to repent of was putting political ideology in front of the spiritual nature of who God is. Of saying, we believe that politically that the Messiah, the rescuer, and the redeemer is going to be a political deliverer and we're putting our hopes in his politics. Jesus said, that's not the kind of Messiah I came to be. I'm not going to get involved in that discussion. I'm going to get involved in the discussion of what it means, the kingdom of God. I'm not talking about the kingdom of Rome. I'm not talking about the kingdom of Israel. I'm talking about the kingdom of God. And one of the things I think we need to repent of, maybe, are our social agendas and our political agendas. We're more concerned about our kingdoms than God's kingdom. And they repented and they turned. I love 1 Thessalonians 1.9. It's the, it's the verse you see down there. Here, here's the picture of repentance. You turned to God, turned from idols, whatever your idol might be, to serve. That's the picture of repentance. You turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God. And then he says the second thing you need to believe, the good news, the good news of God as discovered in Jesus Christ. Believe, it's the word for faith. I wish in our culture, I wish in our world, faith was seen more of a, as a, more of a verb than, an, than a noun. I want you to faith. I want you to repent, but I want you to faith. I want you to keep on living in assurance and in power. I just want you to live that way. Keep living that way. Keep living that way. Keep living that way. Then chapter 1, verses 16 through 20, all of a sudden Jesus starts calling disciples to be part of his mission. He starts calling disciples, and you know what happens when he calls? They immediately follow verse 18 of chapter 1. I think that's going to be on the screen. Verse 18, chapter 1, maybe not. Verse 18 of chapter 1. 
It says that uh, when Jesus called immediately, immediately they responded. Immediately they followed him. There's that word again, immediately, immediately, immediately. Immediately uh, they left their nets and followed him. They are called to do what Jesus says and go where Jesus sends. Do what Jesus says and go where Jesus sends. Then verses 21 through 39. By the way, here, here's my promise to you, because Mark moves quickly, I'm going to move quickly, and I'm not going to get to everything I want to get to, and so um, sometime this week, you can follow my social media, or we'll probably put it on our church, I'm going to go back, and I'm going to preach through uh, what I didn't get to today, <laughs> all right, uh, because I want to honor your time, and there's something else God wants to do in our midst, so I, so I don't have time um, to do this, but verses 21 through 39, verses 21 through 39, shows us a day in the life of Jesus. He goes into the synagogue. Mark, he preaches a sermon. Mark doesn't give us the words of the sermon. He gives us the response of the people. They're amazed that Jesus preaches with authority. In the synagogue, check this out, in the synagogue, he confronts evil. There's evil in the midst of the synagogue. And friends, every time we get together to to worship God, there's spiritual battle going on. There's a spiritual battle. Uh, The enemy doesn't want you to take a spiritual step of victory. He doesn't want you to walk away with assurance, but Jesus comes into the synagogue and he, and he, and he heals an evil man that, that confronts him. The people are amazed that even the evil spirits obey his name. Then he walks out of the synagogue and he goes to Peter's house and Peter's mother-in-law is sick. In verse 31, it says that Jesus touched her and he healed her and immediately she got up and served him. There's the concept of service again. Mark gives you that detail that Jesus is a high touch kind of person that he wants to touch you and heal you that he longs for you and he confronts the evil and, 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 he, and he goes and they bring all the crowds to him and he spends the entire night, the whole crowd comes to the house to heal him. The next morning, they can't find Jesus. It's still dark. Where's Jesus? Well, he's out praying. Every day, Jesus spent time in prayer, spending time with God the Father. And I cannot overemphasize the importance of that moment. I'd plan for this sermon to go a different direction, but every Sunday, we get together and we have a big huddle with everybody that's serving and then the teams break off into their individual huddles. And Brian, if you'd come on up. Brian Kierstead led today our, our creative team huddle. Uh, most of you know Brian, you've seen him, but you haven't seen him for the last uh, uh, six, seven weeks. And there's a reason for that. Brian's been instrumental in, uh, no, no pun intended, um, uh, uh, helping our band continue to grow and thrive and leadership in the life of the church. And Brian uh, was bold and shared something uh, in our team huddle today that I didn't know he was going to share. And I've asked him to come and share it with you now. If you've checked out and you haven't heard anything else, I beg of you, check back in right now. Brian, would you share, please? Morning. Thanks for having me back. Um, So I actually was not prepared for this either, so um, I will do my best to... Repeat what I said earlier, and um, just praying that God will give me clarity and uh, the words to speak, and hopefully for you, for whoever this is for, um, the words to hear. So, uh, I've been out the last few weeks. I've missed you guys. Um, Actually, before I start, I'm going to be a little vulnerable, and this is very raw. Um, I'm still in the middle of this, so I apologize in advance. I will try to be as strong as possible as I share this. Um, so really, my whole life, from my whole adult life, I've uh, struggled with some mental illness, mainly anxiety, depression, things like that. Uh, it's never been a huge deal in that it got in the way of life until recently. Um, I started getting really bad migraines, complex migraines. They were like stroke-like symptoms, couldn't speak, um, affected my vision. It was debilitating. Um, Got to a point where I could not get out of bed. I couldn't be a dad. I couldn't be a husband. I couldn't be an employee. I wasn't going to work. It was ruining my life. Um, There were no other options to get to a doctor that I wanted to see. There was a month or two month long at best waiting list, and I could not wait a month or two. Um, So I checked myself into a hospital. The help that I needed um, and to be able to be back, uh, be able to serve and be able to be a functioning member of society. While I was in there and I got out and uh, been doing some outpatient stuff and continuing my healing, still going through that, um, there were a couple things that I learned right away in that, and this is what I think Dr. Cox wanted me to share. 
uh, the first thing I learned is what it means to spend time with God and um, what that will do for just not only healing, but what that will do in your life. Um, one of the things, you see me up here every week. Um, I play almost every week that I can. Um, I am in some leadership things. I host a life group at my home. Um, I tithe regularly. You know, we talk about the five G's here and I was doing all of that admittedly, except one thing. I was not spending the time that is required with God. I was not spending one-on-one time. I did not have alone time with God, um, really deep in the word, reading my Bible and spending that time that was necessary. And, um, it's funny how (laughs) sometimes God will use, uh, unfortunate circumstances and, uh, things like that in your life to draw you in and bring you back to what's important. And, And that was very important to him. And learning this, it's been very important to me. Um, all the works and all the service and the tithing and the money that I was given and everything else, um, it, it didn't matter when I wasn't spending time with God. So um, that's, the, that's the first thing that I learned is just how to go back to the basics and how to read the Bible, take time every single day, be intentional about um, being in the Word, being with Him, and um, just what an amazing transformation that's done in my life, getting back to the basics. So if you're not doing that, um, number one, I encourage you to really be intentional about spending time with God. And the second thing I learned is uh, there are some great programs out there um, and great hospitals and great institutions, and there are great doctors that are brilliant, and I, would, I could talk to you all day about what I learned um, medically, uh, but they don't they miss a huge opportunity to share the hope and the peace of God and the hope that only Jesus can bring. And that was really disheartening to me. Um, luckily for me, I was strong in my faith and um, I, I know who Jesus is and I know that he is God and I know that he is good and I know that he can be trusted, but so many people there don't know that. And uh, they just for right or wrong, they, they just they just don't do that. There's a lot of great things that they do. That's not one of the things that they do. Um, so while I was in there, we had uh, in our outpatient, you know, there's a group setting, and they uh, had a little fun exercise where they start a sentence, and you had to finish the sentence. So it was things like, um, you know, I am. And I was really good at that one. You know, gorgeous, hilarious. Um you know, those kind of things. Uh, but one of the words that they did is it said, death is. And some of the responses that people had from death is uh, things that you might think, scary, um, inevitable, the end. They were all negative. And uh, when it came to me, they said, Brian, death is, finish the sentence. And I said, the beginning. And he said, interesting. Tell me about that. Tell, tell the group why you say the beginning. And I said, I would be happy to tell you why it's the beginning. So it was just a great way for me to um, bring God in that place and and to share the gospel. But the reason that that's important is because, um, again, I'm I'm just being raw and I'm being vulnerable here. I I spent so much attention on Sunday morning and the things that needed to happen in this place, and it is important. But if they're coming into this place, God is already at work in them. And where I was missing is I was not meeting people where they were. And that is huge. Um, In order for people to grow, it's our responsibility to go to where they are and to meet people where they are. And um, it it just really stuck out to me that there's a lot of people, I'm sure I'm not the only one that's going through anxiety and depression and some of those things. I'm sure a lot of people are going through that, um, if you want to admit it or not. And... um, it's our responsibility to reach a hurting world. They don't know Jesus. They don't have hope. They don't know the peace that only he can bring. And it's our job as followers of Christ, it's our responsibility to go out into the world and to meet them where they are. Because if we don't do it, no one else will. And we have a huge responsibility, um, not only so eternities will be changed and so heaven will be crowded, which it will, uh, but so they can live a life full of hope today and peace today um, that otherwise they they won't have. So um, if I can leave you with those two things in in my experience and learning through this, and thank you for your patience and thanks for having me back. Um, Spend time with God. Be intentional about reading the Bible every single day. Um, It will change your life. And two, 
reach people where they are because if you don't, no one else will. So thank you. Brian shared that this morning, and I, I remember when he was taken to the hospital, and we didn't know what was going on, and sitting in his hospital room and visiting with him, and um, watching he and Trish, Eli, go through this. Um, it's his story to tell, and when he took the courage this morning to tell that to the group, um, I, I stopped. And friend, friends, I, I want to take a minute. For too long, the church, capital C, not mind me about a little church, but the church, capital C, has treated mental illness as a taboo subject that you don't talk about. People have been made to feel that if they struggle with mental illness, depression, discouragement, suicidal thoughts, they can't talk about that because if you just love Jesus a little more, if you just did a little better, you wouldn't have those kind of thoughts. We would never say that to somebody who was diagnosed with cancer. Would never say that to somebody who was diagnosed with Alzheimer's. But for too long the church has said, that means you don't love Jesus enough, and that's not the answer. And so Brian was raw, and he was vulnerable. And I hope that it encourages some of you who maybe are struggling with those same kind of thoughts right now to say, I, I, I need help. I, I want to talk to somebody. Because if you don't, you don't. The end will not be well for you. This is a safe place to have those kind of conversations. And our staff will be quick to tell you, um, we can't help you with that, but we will get you help. We'll help point you to the place, to the people that God has trained and equipped to really help you with some of those issues. So don't be ashamed. It's okay to ask for help. This is a safe environment for you to do that. One of the things Brian said that he learned in those moments was I'm doing a whole bunch of other stuff, good stuff, showing people Jesus. But the one thing I wasn't doing was spending time with God the Father. That's where we left the story in Mark chapter 1. Every day Jesus himself spent time with the Father because he knew the only way to confront the physical evil and the spiritual evil was to have the Father speak into his life every single day. You are my child, I love you. You have the power that you need to confront whatever it is you confront today, and I am with you. I will never leave you, I will never forsake you. I will give you the power to do whatever it is. We walk through the first day in Jesus' life, and the summary, it's on the screen somewhere. I'm jumping around, Jeannie, I don't know where. It simply is this, that Jesus walked around with spiritual authority, and so should you. Because God has spoken assurance and peace into your life. The chapter ends as Jesus is praying. The disciples say, hey, everybody in the city is coming to talk to you. And he says, hey, let's go to some other towns and villages because that's why I came so I can preach there too. The time has come. The name of the game is action. And as they're going, a demon-possessed man comes and confronts Jesus. The scripture says, Mark says, Jesus touched him. I'm sorry, as a man with leprosy. A man with leprosy comes and touches, uh, reaches out to Jesus and Jesus touches him. And Jesus heals him totally and completely. And then Jesus says this weird thing to him. Go show yourselves to the priest, but don't tell anybody what I've done for you. And the man disobeys. He can't keep it to himself. And he starts telling people what Jesus had done for him. So much so that Mark chapter 1 ends that Jesus had to go and hide because he didn't have time to do what God sent him to do. And we like to criticize this man. Jesus told you don't. You went out and did it anyway. But how many times do we do the same exact thing? Jesus told us don't. And we ignore what he had to say and we justify it. And what if when we do what he says don't, what if we hinder the work that he's called us to do? I don't know. I don't know. And there's so much more I want to go into, but I don't want to do that. But when Jesus touches this man, body is healed. Here's the takeaway for you today. Wherever you're at, Jesus cares less about where you were 
and more about where you're going. Jesus cares less about where you were. In the society, this man had leprosy, so he's an outcast, and he wasn't welcomed, and he was separated from his family, and it was probably people thought his fault. Jesus cares less about where you were and more about where you're going. So one question left for you today very simply is this. What is God asking you to do immediately? Because here's what's going to happen. You're going to leave here today. You're going to go home. Uh, You're going to get busy in activities. You're going to go uh, to brunch. You're going to go to lunch. You're going to go to that. You're going to get involved in all the things around your house. Something's going to happen. Um, Some situation at work, you've got to rush off to work. Some situation at home, some emergency, something's going to happen. You're going to forget what we talked about today. And and here's the deal. By Wednesday this week, you're going to wonder if you were even in church on Sunday. Because life just happened. You're going to forget everything I said. You're going to forget everything Brian said. That's why every week we ask you, respond now. What do you need to do immediately? Don't walk out of here without doing it. Don't get up from the screen that you're behind today without doing what God's called you to do. I don't know what that is, but God has spoken, and he wants you to walk in power. He wants you to walk in assurance. And for some of you who've never trusted in Jesus, you need to do that today. This might be your last chance. Father, your spirit has been at work. And I don't want to get in the way of that. So whatever you're doing, I pray that you give my friends that are in this room, my friends that are watching uh, behind some screen, whether it's on Sunday or someday later, God, I pray that right now, they know, you've spoken with clarity, they know immediately, right now, what they're supposed to do. God, I pray that they would respond with a sense of urgency and immediately say, yes, Jesus, I will. I will accept you as my Savior. I will serve you and follow you as my Lord. I will reach out and I will will not just come into church to confront evil. I will will go out into the world and confront evil in the name and in the power and the assurance of Jesus. God, I will do what you call me to do. I will do what you say to do, and I will go where you say to go. God, whatever it is that we need to do immediately, we do that. I'm just going to ask that um, if you have our app, you'd fill out on the app what it is that God's asked you to do. I'd ask that you respond immediately. I'd ask that if you're in the room and you don't have the app, you fill it out on the back of your card. I just want you to continue to spend time with Christ. He's spoken before you walk out of the room, before you walk out of the room, before you get up from your screen. Do what he says to do. Be willing to go where he says to go. So no music's going to play. I'm going to ask you guys to not play any other music. I'm just going to ask that in silence you have the moment to spend time with God. I'll be down here in front. I'll pray with you. When you're done doing business with God, when you've done what he's called you to do, when you're willing to go where he tells you to go, leave this place. Evil's waiting for you on the other side of the door. Be prepared for it. Be ready for it. Go, share and show the love of Jesus. When you're ready to go out of the room, you do that. Um, You stay here as long as you need. If uh, you're still here and we need to keep the folks that are coming at 11 out, we'll keep them out if you just need to do that kind of business with God. I'm here at the front to pray with you, to talk with you. Father, Would you do what only you can do? May we respond with obedience, with urgency, and immediately do what you've called us to do. May Jesus not come back before next week. I look forward to continuing this journey through the Gospel of Mark with you. God loves you. I love you. Have a great week. Close my eyes and walk.